This video is the second part of acid-base titrations. As a recap, acid-base titrations are neutralization reactions between an acid and a base. And typically in the experiment, we're adding a reagent called a titrant to an analyte. The titrant is usually either a strong acid, like hydronium ion, or a strong base, like hydroxide. In the last video, we looked at analytes that were either a strong acid or a weak acid, and they were being titrated with hydroxide. At the end of today's video, I'll return to acid again, but now for a polyprotic acid. But first, I'd like to start with the opposite scenario, where now our analyte is either a strong base or a weak base. And now, as a titrant, we will use the hydronium ion. In the first example, we'll look at the titration of a strong base sodium hydroxide with the strong acid HCl. So HCl and sodium hydroxide being strong will fully dissociate to form hydroxide ions and hydronium ions. In the plot below, this titration is represented by the gray curve that's labeled A. And this is a pH titration curve, where along the y-axis is the pH, along the x-axis is the volume of added HCl. Initially, we don't have any added acid, and so the hydroxide concentration is just the original concentration, and that would correspond to a really basic pH of 13. As we add acid, we start to react away that hydroxide, and so we would expect the pH to go down. And it does gradually until it nears the equivalence point which again is defined as when the moles of titrant, in this case hydronium ions, that are added is just equal to the moles of hydroxide that were present initially. So at this point, because they're equimolar, they basically perfectly annihilate each other such that their concentrations are about zero and their pH then would be 7. The hydronium concentration will approach 0 0.1 molar, which is that of the titrant, and that corresponds to pH that also approaches 1. In the second example, we'll look at the titration of a weak base ammonia, again using the strong acid HCl. This titration curve is now shown in red and labeled B. So you can see the strong base titration underneath it, and there's again key differences depending whether it's a strong versus a weak base. And we want to address these differences, such as why is a starting pH slightly lower or less basic for a weak base? Also, in this region where the curve is fairly flat, it looks quite different from that of the strong base. The equivalence point where the moles of added HCl just equals the moles of the base also has a different pH. Now the pH is less than 7 or acidic. After the equivalence point, you can see that these curves line up nicely because we're just building in hydronium ions in both cases. Let's address the starting pH and why it's slightly lower. Remember, ammonia being a weak base can also dissociate water to form hydroxide and its conjugate acid, ammonium ion. Now the equilibrium for this reaction is Kb is quite small, and so we do not favor these products but we do form a minute amount of hydroxide that can contribute to the pH such that it's about 11. So again, weak bases only dissociate partially, and that amount of hydroxide that it does dissociate is responsible then for the pH. Another key difference is the pH at the equivalence point. 
Now the pH is acidic or less than 7. And again, we want to think about this neutralization reaction where we have ammonia reacting with hydronium ion to form water and the conjugate acid ammonium ion. At the equivalence point, by definition, the moles of added hydronium ions will just equal the initial moles of NH3. And so after neutralization, we essentially have no ammonia left, no hydronium ions left, and really the primary species that's left in solution is the conjugate acid ammonium ion. And ammonium ion is capable of performing a weak acid dissociation. And so in water, it will form some hydronium ion and some of its conjugate base. And this is a Ka reaction. Now, not a lot of hydronium ions will be formed because Ka is a small value, but there's enough such that the pH will become acidic. The next area that's different between the strong and weak base is this area shown in blue for the weak base. So this part of the curve is actually fairly flat as we approach the equivalence point. It's also the part where we would have added enough hydronium ions to form ammonium ion from the NH3 present in solution. And yet, because we're still not at the equivalence point, that means we still have the weak base ammonia also left over in appreciable amounts. So this would be the buffer region because both the weak base and its conjugate acid are present in appreciable amounts. And this is the equation we would use to solve for the pH of that buffer. Now remember that buffers can have a fairly wide range where this ratio can be anywhere from 10 to 1 all the way to 1 to 10. And then this would correspond to a pH range of pKa minus 1 to pKa plus 1. So right in the midpoint here would be halfway to the equivalence point shown by this green line. And at that midpoint, the amount of hydronium ions would be exactly half of the initial amount of ammonia. And so what that means then is half of the original ammonia would have gone on to form its conjugate acid, but the other half would stay behind as the weak base. And so that means these concentrations of the weak base and its conjugate acid are equal, and then the ratio would be 1, and the pH then would be equal to the pKa of the ammonium cation at 9.25. And so to just fill in the whole buffer region here, remember we can go from 10 to 1 to 1 to 10, and those would be represented by these blue dashed lines. And then at these extremes of the buffer, their pH would be equal to pKa minus 1 or pKa plus 1. We finally arrived at the last example of a polyprotic acid titration with sodium hydroxide. Before I do so, I just want to recap what we had learned for the titration of a monoprotic weak acid, like acetic acid. So here we have the titration curve with the pH as a function of the volume of added sodium hydroxide. At the first point shown in red is when we only have acetic acid and it can undergo a weak acid dissociation reaction to form some hydronium ions. And so the starting pH is acidic, but not as acidic as a strong acid. As we add base, and we slowly build an acetate to the point where we reach the midpoint of the buffer region where acetate and acetic acid 
are in equal concentration. Here the pH will now be equal to the pKa of acetic acid. As we continue to add base, we reach a point where we have added enough base that it reacts away all the original acetic acid. And what's left behind is the conjugate base acetate. And conjugate base can dissociate in water to form hydroxide. And therefore, the pH at this point is basic. And after the equivalence point, we continue to build in hydroxide. And so that's responsible for the final pH changes, where we eventually reach a pH of about 13 that would correspond to the concentration of the hydroxide in the titrant solution. For the polyprytic acid, I've chosen sulfurous acid, or H2SO3. This is a diprytic acid where two protons can be ionized. Because it's an acid, we do want to use a strong base like potassium hydroxide as our titrant. As before, this is our pH titration curve, where pH is plotted as a function of the added amount of base. And you can see there's a lot more curvature, but it should make sense that we begin at acidic pH and towards the end, when the titrant potassium hydroxide is dominant, we would end up at the basic pH. Now these extra curvatures for a polyprytic acid really represent the fact that you can lose these protons one at a time. And so each loss of proton will have its own equivalence point and also its own buffer zone. On the right, I show the different protonated states. So we start at the bottom with sulfurous acid, and if we lose one proton in a Ka1 equilibrium, we generate its conjugate base hydrogen sulfite. Now hydrogen sulfite itself can be a weak acid, and it can engage in a Ka2 equilibrium to finally form the sulfite dianion. So let's go through all the different points along this curve, starting with just having no base added and only having sulfurous acid. So this is a weak acid and it will dissociate in water to form some hydronium ion. And so the pH will be acidic. Now among the weak acids, Sulfurous so acid is one of the stronger ones, and that's why the starting pH is actually quite low. But it is still formally classified as a weak acid. As we add base, we continuously remove those ionizable protons, where we finally reach the sulfite dianion. But we also start to build in hydroxide because there's no more acid for it to react. And as hydroxide builds, it allows us to reach these very basic pH values. So now let's fill in what's in between. Moving to the inner portion of the pH curve, you'll notice that at points 2 and 4, the pH changes are quite steep. And these are corresponding to the equivalence points. There are two equivalence points because there are two protons to lose. So the first equivalence point would be at this point 2, shown in green, where we would have just added enough hydroxide to fully react away H2SO3. And so the main species left in solution is hydrogen sulfite anion. This is an amphiprotic ion, meaning that it can either engage in a Ka or a Kb reaction. And depending which is favored, that will determine the pH at the first equivalence point. A little while ago, we had a video where we talked about this anion, and the Ka was larger than its Kb. And at this equivalence point, um, you can see the pH is in fact acidic. At the second equivalence point shown in purple, now we would have added double the moles of hydroxide as there were of the initial weak acid, H2SO3. It's double because the first portion of hydroxide 
fully removes the first proton, and the second portion or doubling of the hydroxide volume finally removes that second proton. And so at the second equivalence point, all we have left is the sulfite dianion. The remaining parts of the titration curve are in zones 1 and 3, where the pH changes are minimized. And these are our buffer zones. So the first buffer zone is shown in orange. And at the very midpoint of this buffer zone, the pH would be equal to pKa1. So at this point, the concentration of the diprotic acid and HSO3- minus would be perfectly equal. And these two species are related by Ka1. And so the pH would be pKa1. In the second buffer zone, we reach a point where now the two equimolar species are HSO3- minus and the sulfate dianion. Now these two species are related in the Ka2 equilibrium. So where these species are equal, the pH will now be equal to pKa2. So that concludes our lecture video today. And essentially for a weak polyprotic acid, you have the same types of points for a monoprotic weak acid, except you would have a buffer zone and an equivalence point for each of the protons that can be lost.